Now from the University of Okaboji, it's Okaboji Broadcast with Jeff Thee. Welcome to Okaboji Broadcast, everybody. I'm Jeff Thee, coming to you from the Fish Hatchery right here in the north end of East Lake Okaboji, south end of uh, Big Spirit. I have Mike Hawkins here with me from the Iowa DNR. And Mike, first of all, thanks for taking a few minutes with me. Sure. Uh, wish we had other things to, to talk about. Right. And I can... And I can go back, I'm going to say 25 years, and I'm talking to people from the, the DNR, uh, the Dickens County Nature Center, Lakeside Labs, and talking about the dreaded Eurasian milfoil getting into the Iowa Great Lakes chain of lakes. Right. And, and here we are. Right. That's, and that's really how our program started um, in aquatic invasive species in the Iowa Great Lakes and across the state. Our first uh, statewide project uh, with aquatic invasive species was to write a plan and uh, one of the first in the nation to actually put together an invasive species uh, prevention plan and then get federal funding for that right. so we've got a long history in that and really the focus early on in that was Eurasian water milfoil this particular plant species yeah and I can remember back at the time I'm talking about zebra mussels and that and right but Eurasian was the one that is a, a lake killer the the density of what comes out of this, mm -hmm. and you had, and you regularly do water tests, and had done as recently as July, and things were were clear. So we've, there's a lot of invasive species that we're looking for. Um, the list has grown from those early days of the invasive species program. Unfortunately, zebra mussels, uh, uh, big headed and silver carp. Uh, there's yeah. a number of other aquatic uh, species of plants as well that are invasive in Iowa and we have a pretty robust monitoring program our aquatic invasive species program and our aquatic plant management program both uh, work to monitor Iowa's lakes they are out um, a couple times a summer on every one of our lakes looking right. for uh, invasive species so they're out surveying doing rake grabs uh, they look around boat ramps those are the high probability areas for introduction and uh, they're they're out there monitoring and and in June, uh, there was a, a survey done in the Iowa Great Lakes. They did not find anything out of the ordinary. Um, it came back in August, and uh, we picked up Eurasian water milfoil in multiple locations. Yeah, and let's talk about some of those locations where, uh, where you were finding it. So we looked throughout the Iowa Great Lakes. We're in uh, Big Spirit Lake, Center Lake, uh, East Okaboji, and the Lower Chain. Uh, currently, where we found Eurasian water milfoil is uh, East Okaboji, Upper Gar, Lake Miniwashita, and Lower Gar. Right. So that we have not seen the, that plant in the other locations in the Iowa Great Lakes. Could that be due to its shallower bodies of water going down that end, or, or probably due to where it was first introduced? Okay. All right. um, if I had to guess, and this is just a guess, it looks like maybe that introduction occurred in some in Upper Gar, okay. maybe maybe around that Upper Gar boat ramp. Okay. It seems to be where we're seeing the most plant at this point is there. And then it's kind of just spread out from from that location. And like wildfire, this yeah. stuff can. Yeah, it's really growing fast. Um, you know, the plant can grow six inches a day. So, and it and it puts all of its energy into getting to the surface of the water. And once it gets there, it branches out right. and creates those mats on the surface that we see in places where it's in, um, it, it's encountered. Not all lakes react the same to Eurasian water milfoil. Okay. Um, it can, in certain circumstances, exist in the background, um, and maybe a couple of bays might be affected by it. Um, in other lakes, uh, it can cause a, a lot of problems yeah. and really uh, uh, choke out areas. And that's uh, very hard to predict. It's very hard to know where in the Iowa Great Lakes it could be a problem where it, where it maybe is, is okay. We do know that places that have healthy, diverse native plant communities, so those plants that have always been here, right. when we see those native plant communities in good diversity, uh, Eurasian water milfoil has a hard time finding a place to, to colonize. It's got competition. Is that kind of what it comes? Good down competition. To? Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, a place like East Okaboji, um, the lower chain, we've actually seen some improvements in water clarity over the last few years. Curdle leaf pondweed has taken advantage of that. Yeah. Um, and now, uh, Eurasian water milfoil is starting to take advantage of that as well. Yeah. And it's a it's a bad time for an introduction because uh, East Okaboji Lake uh, especially has been showing signs of 
much improved water clarity and water quality and improved yeah. habitat. I know folks have been struggling with curly leaf pondweed, but it, it, the lake is becoming healthier uh, through time, and, and so it's unfortunate to have a couple of these invasive species that are out competing some of the native plants. Yeah, and, and due to the treatments you've done on the curly leaf, um, certainly we were talking about yesterday at the supervisor meeting that on the other side of the bridge of 9 and 71 on the north end of that there's boat traffic out there and boats right. coming in. And uh, a couple of years ago, it was so thick you, you know, yeah. until it died off, there was no getting through. Right. And so, yeah, that, that curly leaf has really caused some issues. And it's really important to clarify, I think, the difference between these two plants. Uh, your a curly leaf pondweed is gone by the 4th of July. Right. So it, it its life cycle is over. It is a weird plant in that it germinates in the fall, unlike any of our terrestrial plants that we have, yeah. any of our underwater plants. It germinates in the fall. It grows maybe about six to eight inches, and then it kind of goes into a dormant phase under the ice. And in the spring, it then takes off and comes shoots to the surface. Right. Eurasian water milfoil is a little more like our native plants, except it germinates very early in the spring. So it'll germinate um, quickly in the spring to outcompete some of those native plants. It will be competing directly with curly leaf pondweed as it comes to the surface. And there are, of course, all plants are competing for light. Right. That's that limiting factor for for uh, for plant life is is light is sunlight. And so, whoever makes gets that race done to the surface first wins. Right. And unfortunately, Eurasian water milfoil will shade out many of the native plants all summer long. Yeah. At least with curly leaf pondweed, as it dies off in late June and early July. Uh, the, the native plant community has has some time has and, their opportunity yep has an opportunity to, yeah. to develop and and um, create some resiliency in the lake so yeah. but though that's the difference in these two plants right. um, the other big difference is is that uh, curly leaf pondweed creates turions which kind of analogous to a seed they're not quite a seed they're just a they're just a, a vegetative growth structure, so they're yeah. the same plant, just a fragment of it. Yeah, right. Those little turions can exist in the sediment for many, many years. And so it, the curly leaf pondweed creates its seed bed. So even if we treat it, it can come back the following year because it has that seed bed to rely on for recolonization. Right. Eurasian water milfoil, though, does not go to seed here, and it spreads solely by fragmentation. So if a, a piece of that plant is broken off, it will float in the lake, come in contact with the sediment, and create a new root system. Yeah. So that fragment um, becomes a new plant. But because it doesn't have a seed bed, we have an opportunity to actually do some treatment on it that can have some lasting impact. Right, which is exactly where we are now. Right. Uh, we had well, a meeting with the different protective associations, and, and right. uh, let's talk about the the treatment and and the cost. Sure. Of, uh, so in in Iowa, we've been very very aggressive with treatment of Eurasian water milfoil since the beginning of, the, of our invasive species program. Our staff have done an amazing job of understanding the plant and putting together uh, herbicide applications that actually have been able to eradicate it in most situations. Yeah. Um, because of the, because of that lack of seed bed. Uh, we can do a full lake uh, treatment and kill the plant completely so that it can't come back, it can't fragment, it can't spread right. if it's not there. Um, and so in most places where we've had Eurasian water milfoil show up, our team has been able to wipe it out, has been able to stop it. This is a little different because of the complexity of the, the lake chain right. and the size, the sheer volume of water that we're working with here. Right. But we've put together a plan or an option, and we wanted to discuss this with the community, but we put a, together an option where we quickly try to do our eradication strategy um, and uh, use a herbicide mm -hmm. that's approved for this use. It is a herbicide with uh, very few restrictions on it for use, for right. swimming, for fishing, for drinking water. Um, in fact, the EPA has a special category, a low-risk herbicide category for these types of herbicides. Okay. The other amazing thing about the, the herbicide that we're proposing to use is that it is specific to, when it's applied the way we're going to apply it, it's very specific to Eurasian water milfoil and curly leaf pondweed. Ah. So uh, this particular herbicide 
is uh, effective against both of those plants and can be used in a way that's not detrimental to the native plant community. Right. So very, very specific approach, a great tool, um, but that does come with some expense. Yes. Um, and most of that is because of the volume of water that we're talking about. Right. So our current proposal is, and uh, the community has unanimously, so far unanimously come out in support of, of trying to nip this in the bud, right. trying to... Um, make an eradication attempt, uh, we would treat East Okoboji and the lower chain, so Upper Gar, Lake Miniwashita, and Lower Gar, mm-hmm. uh, with a multi-month treatment. So we, we make an application of the herbicide, and because this is a very slow-acting herbicide, it has to be maintained at a very low concentration for a very long time. Okay. And uh, what happens is the plants starve. Those, those particular plants are unable to make a pigment, and right. photosynthesize, yes. and they will they will starve, and so uh, that's how this this product works. Um, and so that that's what we're proposing. That's what we'd like to try. Um, we know that if the plant has spread out beyond those four lakes, that it could be reintroduced. It could be reintroduced on a boat coming down the road, uh, you know, next week. Yeah, but I think you know with our track record of holding this plant out for as long as we have at the Iowa Great Lakes, uh, the potential impacts that the plant could have on recreation and, and uh, lake ecology, I think we're all kind of in the same, come to the same conclusion that we're willing to take that risk and see if we can't stop this plant right yeah. in its tracks. Yeah, and I was thinking about that yesterday when we were meeting, just to, and going back those 25, whatever years it yeah. is that we've been talking about this, and I thought, gosh, we've done so good you know, at educating people, people right. coming to our uh, boat ramps and having cleaned their prop the, underneath their boat, uh, having dumped their live well, all these things. So if they were in a, a body of water that had it, they weren't bringing it to the Isle of Great Lakes. Right. And, you know, we've got new laws in place as well to stop that transport of plants and water down the road. There's pretty stiff penalties for doing that. With that mantra of clean, drain, dry uh, your boat and trailer before you go to another water body. The awareness has gone from very little uh, that people understood about aquatic invasive species to to nearly complete awareness now about plants. Yeah. You know, and we're targeting that audience, the boater boater audience. Yeah. Um, and so, folks that are moving their boats around at least have that awareness. Um, it's up to them. It's a personal responsibility issue to make sure that you're doing that. Yeah. Um, there can't be a conservation officer at every corner watching watching every no. boat that's down, going down the road, but. They are on the on the lookout for that. Anybody yeah. that's dragging that plant material down the road um, could be endangering another resource. All right now, and we talked about the the cleaning and, and dumping of the well. Now, after it's, I've been in another lake. It happened mm-hmm. to be in there. My boat dries. Am, am I still a carrier or? Um, well, we recommend five to ten days of drying time. Okay. All right. So, um, and if you can't do that than a hot power washer to actually clean and disinfect that boat. Yeah. And that that works for not just your Asian water milfoil, but a variety of species that you could be carrying that you not you're not aware of. Right. And so that, that drying period is really important. Um, and if you if you can't then getting to that hot hot power washer and actually doing some good cleaning and, and scrubbing, making sure that your live wells are clean. I'll, I'll talk for our agency, our boats that are in the water, uh, the Fisheries Bureau. Every time that we're in a water body, we come back to the shop, we hot power wash yeah. with a hot sea, we run a, a diluted bleach solution through our cooling system on our motors. Yeah. Any of our buckets, any of our live wells that had water in them, we disinfect all of those yeah. before we can go to another a water body. Yeah. So we're taking extra precautions um, because we just can't risk carrying the stuff around. No. Well, and if you are, you're going from body of water to body of water. You need right. to be on the... And I think of uh, lakes in Minnesota that early on just got inundated so heavily with this stuff. Yeah, and some of the states have taken different approaches to Eurasian water milfoil. And, um, you know, in Iowa, we've stayed very, very aggressive, and it's paid off for yeah. a lot of years. It's allowed some of these tools, these herbicides, to be developed specifically for Eurasian water milfoil. And and um, it's given us uh, tools that we didn't have 10 or 15 years ago yeah. to, to try to combat this plant. Thank goodness for the development uh, of this herbicide. You right, know, that, right. Uh, other life in the lake uh, won't be affected, and, right. and it 
targets this one thing we right. don't want well two if you count curly leaf yep, yep. <laughs> as well yeah we've, a- we've actually got two herbicides one's a spot treatment and uh, the other one is this whole lake treatment that we can use and so there's a, a couple of them that are very specific to this these invasive invasive species so it, it's it's exciting to have those tools but unfortunate that we're looking at using them because they they can drive um, you know the cost of using these is, is pretty high yeah so what's the process now uh, to get started when do we start and uh... so the, the fundraising is, has taken place um, the Department of Natural Resources has dedicated about one hundred fifty thousand dollars to this project yeah. Uh, the East Okaboji Lakes Improvement Corporation and the Okaboji Pro- Protective Association have both pledged about fifty thousand dollars. And then uh, yesterday, the Dickens County Supervisors voted to fill that last gap in the in the project costs with uh, eighty five thousand dollars of funding. Um, so, with those dollars in place, we're in the process of purchasing the first application, the, yeah. the chemical for the first uh, application. We would hope to have that in place in the next 10 days. Okay. So it's going to happen very quickly. We don't want to wait any longer. No. This plant is growing very, very quickly out there. I'm seeing it in more and more places. Yeah. Well, and you had mentioned yesterday, not to mention exactly where yeah, it was, but, right. but a boat coming out of uh, East Lake and just Yeah, the, the, the trailer that was coming out um, was had Eurasian water milfoil all over it. Yeah. So And that's, that's a change just from a couple weeks ago. Yeah. So. so, well, my friend, appreciate all the efforts and, and uh, thank thank goodness we have an answer. You yeah, know, well, at least a, a, an, that, a, an for, attempt, right? An yeah. att- yes, and uh, that we can um, fight it. And but uh, we, uh, if this is successful, then we really got to make people know that boy, you just you just got to be very careful. You do. Um, we have a responsibility to bequeath these beautiful lakes we have to our children, grandchildren, and, and on down the line. And uh, it doesn't take much for something to change it entirely. No, it's just one one boat or trailer coming down the road that has that attached. And yeah. we, we simply cannot be everywhere to, to make sure that that isn't the case. So folks have really got to be diligent with their boats and trailers, and not just for Eurasian water milfoil. You know, we have zebra mussels. A lot of lakes around us do not. Right. A boat leaving here with water on board can introduce zebra mussels to a brand new water body yeah. uh, just that quick. Yeah. So we all have to be diligent. And but uh, now, if people have questions, they're like, even what can I do? And, and some of these steps, uh, where's the best place to find out answers, Mike? Well, for aquatic invasive species, there's plenty of online resources. Um, they're always welcome to call the fish hatchery here if they've got questions about equipment or okay. moving a hoist uh, around. A lot of our lake service providers um, have permits in place that allow them to move uh, things around, so they're pretty well educated, but uh, you know, folks can find more information. We're going to be trying to get more information out about this treatment yeah. um, it, very quickly. We want to make sure that we're getting everyone informed and educated. The one thing I would I would like to say, and I, there's so much misinformation about plants and aquatic right. plants. People call them weeds. I hate I hate the term <laughs> weed because right. we have uh, native plant diversity here, like unlike anywhere else in the state, and it is the reason that these lakes are so healthy. Right. So when we when we look at um, aquatic plants and lakes across the state, the best highest quality resources have these diverse plant communities. And I know those native plants can cause problems for folks, but you have to understand that it's, it's like the native prairie. Right. That diversity out there is healthy, and if you open up an area, if you, if you plowed up an area and just left it sit, what would come in? It's yeah. not the prairie, it's gonna be weed, That's real weeds. Exactly right. The things that you don't want. And so uh, having a healthy, diverse plant community is so important, and I, and I think folks really need to have a little more tolerance for yeah. those native plants because yeah. they are so important for the lake. Yeah. We're going to work on these invasives as hard as we can, but um, I, I think we got to have a better appreciation for native plants. Yeah, very. And the, like you said about the prairie, that opens it up perfectly. You know, we got trees, tall grasses, and yeah. and uh, those all make them. Then yeah, you plow them up, and whoops, there you go. So, yeah, yeah, right. All right. Thank you for taking time with me, and uh, and if we need to talk in the future about 
things coming up, we certainly will, Mike. But thanks yeah, for taking time with me now. All Thank right. you. Mike Hawkins again here with the uh, Iowa DNR here at the Fisheries Hatchery uh, here in Spirit Lake. We want to thank him for taking time with us. We want to thank you for watching us right here on Okaboji Broadcast. Okaboji Broadcast from the studios at Historic Arnold's Park Amusement Park is brought to you in part by the Scott Troutman State Farm Agency in Spirit Lake, Quest Wealth Management, a financial advisory practice of Ameriprise Financial Services, advisor Jan Spielman, A.J. Spielman, and Erica Wachholz. The headquarters of the University of Okaboji is at the Three Suns, open Monday through Saturday 10 to 5 and Sunday from 10 to 4. Bank Midwest, dream big, plan wisely, live well. Lakes Regional Healthcare and Avera Partner. Ruth Van Locker at the Lake, where carnivores are welcome on Hill Avenue in Spirit Lake. Beck Engineering in Spirit Lake. B Radiant Laser Skin Studio in the Okaboji Plaza in Okaboji. 